Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to another edition of our Anchored in the Word Morning Reflection, and we are in episode 42 today. Uh, we're back in Luke chapter 8, looking at the parable of the sower. And so if you have a Bible, I'd really like to encourage you to take it. Let's turn together and look at this uh, very important passage of Scripture. And uh, today we're going to start digging into some of the details. So here's what it says, Luke chapter 8, and we're starting in verse 4. When much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. It was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. Some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered, and because it lacked because it lacked moisture. Some fell amongst thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Others fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples asked him, saying, what might this parable be? He said unto you, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might see, hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they which hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which they hear and they receive it with joy, These have no root, which is, for a while they believe, and in time of temptation they fall away. That which fell amongst the thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures in this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. And that on the good ground are they which, in in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience." This is a very important passage for us to understand, and uh, the details that are here, because we're so familiar with them, a lot of times we fail to recognize the, the ultimate intent of what's there. And so last time, yesterday, we talked about the importance of understanding the nature of Scripture, and that really is at the heart of what we're talking about here in the parable of the sower. Well, today what I'd like to do is I'd kind of like to give you a summary statement, and then I want us to dig into some very important details. And then from there, uh, throughout the week, we're going to get into interpretation and application, but today we're just going to look at details. So first of all, let me give you Uh, the summary statement that I came up with for the parable. The parable of the sower was meant to prepare the disciples for the various responses that they would witness as they proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. It was also to strengthen their confidence in the power of the word and to divert them away from pragmatic compromises and discouragement. When I think about what this parable is all about, if you are in ministry or you have any desire to reach people with the gospel or to see their lives built on the truth, you need to understand the the content of this particular parable. And so he wants to encourage, he wants to build their confidence in the word of God, he wants to prepare them for the kinds of things that they're going to encounter, and he wants them to make sure they don't compromise the message in any way. So let's look at the details. The first thing I'm going to show you from these verses is found in verse number five. A farmer goes out and he does his job. If you're a farmer, you have really two jobs. One is to plant the seed and then to bring in the harvest. And in between, obviously, you're going to take care of what's there. But in this particular passage, the way that he puts it is he says, a sower goes out and he sows his seed. The next detail is extremely important. And by the way, the way that this farmer, (coughs) excuse me, did his job is actually very different than the way that I would do my job as someone who loves to garden in my own yard. Uh, I am very cautious about uh, building up raised beds. I put in uh, compost in in the fall and in the winter so that all breaks down during the cold months. And uh, I've got trellises that I've built in my backyard for grapes and for all different kinds of things that are growing. But that's not the way that this particular guy is planting the seed. Notice what it says in verse 6. As he sowed, some fell. And he talks about all the different kinds of soils that it falls on. We're going to get into that in just a second. But the way that he plants the seed is that without any deliberation, without any discrimination, he takes the seed and he just spreads it 
in the field where he ha where where he is. This is different than the way that we farm. You know, if a person is uh, has a, has a massive farm, they have tractors and they they till the soil and they plant the seed in rows. If someone has a backyard garden, they have raised beds, all those kinds of things. That's not the way he's doing it. He's just, without any kind of deliberation, he's not saying, oh, I'm not going to sow that area because that soil is not good. He's not going out and digging up the soil. All he's doing is taking the seed and he's just spreading it indiscriminately. And that's very significant to what Jesus is getting at in this parable. So don't miss that detail. The third detail that I want us to notice is that the seed fell on different kinds of soil environments. So it says in verse number five, some fell on the wayside. When he uses the word wayside, the idea is this is a walking path. So this is a large field and there were certain places where people probably cut across the field or there are places where people are walking alongside the field. And so as he throws out this seed, some of it lands on places that the ground is, is as hard as concrete. Now, it's still soil, it's still dirt, but it is so compacted that there's no way that the seed can penetrate that soil. The second environment that's mentioned is in verse six. It says, some fell upon a rock. And when he talks about a rock, what he's saying is this is an area where there are large boulders or stones under the surface. There's a little bit of soil that's that's up on top of that. But, but for all practical purposes, this is like a pile of sand on your driveway, okay? And so if a seed falls on a pile of sand on your driveway, it is possible that you could get uh, something growing there, but the truth is that as soon as the summer heat hits that, it's just going to die. It doesn't have the ability to plant roots down deep, and so it's not totally different than things falling on the wayside where the ground is as hard as concrete. The third thing that we see is in verse 7. He says some fell amongst thorns. Now there were certain places in the field where uh, there were there were briars and there were there were weeds that were growing everywhere, and the seed falls in that area. And the environment is uh, it's hell it's 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 good enough that the seed could actually germinate and that a plant can maybe start to grow. But the problem is that everything around it is growing as well, and so what's growing around it eventually is going to choke it out. It doesn't have the ability to to grow to maturity and to produce fruit. This reminds me of when I was in Ghana and I decided to uh, to take uh, corn and I decided to, to, to grow that and peanuts at the same time. Well, the first time I did this, um, I planted I planted the peanuts first. And then as the peanuts were growing, I, I tried to plant the corn up in there. And I thought, well, the corn grows faster than the peanuts. And so it'll be fine. Well, what ended up happening was the corn never got taller than the peanuts. And eventually what we had was no corn, just peanuts everywhere. So I learned from that. And I realized you got to plant your corn first. And when it gets to a certain height, that's when you can put all of your peanuts in there. That's kind of the picture that we have here. That My situation, I was planning it. He wasn't planning it. And then in the fourth example, some fell on the good ground. The idea that this is soil that is soft enough that the seed can penetrate the surface. It's deep enough that when the seed germinates, it's able to plant roots down deep. Um, it's an environment that is conducive for growth. There are different kinds of soils. And when he throws out the seed, he does not discriminate between the hard, the rocky, the thorny, and the good ground. He just throws out the seed everywhere. That is a really, really important detail. The fourth thing I want you to notice, that is in, in that all four cases, there was a potential for the seed to produce life that produced fruit. Okay, there was nothing wrong with the seed that fell on the hard ground. And there was nothing wrong with the seed that fell on the stony, rocky ground. There's nothing wrong with the seed that fell in the places where there were thorns or where the ground was good. The seed wasn't the problem. The seed had the same nature. It had the same ability to produce life and that life ultimately to produce fruit. The problem was that there were really two ultimate outcomes. You say, well, I thought there were four different outcomes. You know, some is stolen away by the birds and some kind of grows, and then it gets, it gets crushed by the heat. And then some gets, gets crushed by the thorns and the thistles and some produces fruit. Really, from the perspective of Christ, there are two responses. One response is, is diverse in its response. And the other one is consistent, but there's two basic responses. The first response is that there were some plants that never produced fruit. They never grew to the point that they had the ability 
to produce fruit. And the problem was in the seed. The problem was with the soil. The second is a, is a group that when it was planted, it produces fruit. Now, what's interesting about, about this passage in Luke chapter 8, if you compare it to the Matthew passage, Jesus makes a distinction in the Matthew passage, or Matthew records the distinction that Jesus makes, that even though some plants, a bunch produce fruit, they didn't produce it equally. And, and Luke does not record that detail. It may be possible that Jesus preached this in several different contexts, and sometimes he emphasized that, and sometimes he didn't. Or maybe that Luke didn't feel like it was necessary to record that detail, but Matthew did. But the, but the point is that there are two ultimate ways that it falls out. One produces fruit, one doesn't produce fruit. The last detail I want to draw your attention to is that when Jesus taught the parable, the disciples didn't understand what the purpose was. And it's not that the details were complicated in any way. They knew that Jesus was trying to teach something, but they didn't know what it was. We see in verse 9, it says, his disciples asked him, saying, what might this parable be? In fact, that's the way most people responded to the parables of Christ. They didn't understand the intent. They understood the details. They understood what the story was communicating, but they didn't understand why he was giving the story, what Jesus was trying to communicate. And by the way, by the end of the story, he's going to tell them exactly what it is. But that's also a very important detail. They needed to ask because it wasn't clear the, the intention behind Christ's teaching. So those are the details that I want us to look at this morning. You might say, well, well Joel, what do we take away from that? Let me give you a couple of thoughts to consider. Yesterday, we talked about in our introduction that the scripture has authority, it has purity, and it is sufficient. That means that when we read the scriptures, we're reading God's words, not just his thoughts or his ideas or his doctrines, his words. Very, very important. Every word God breathed. We talked about the fact that the word of God is pure. The scriptures are pure because God is the ultimate source. Not a man. God used men, but they're not the ultimate source. When we talked about sufficiency. We recognize that, that there was a specific body of information that God wanted to give us. And that body of information is fully sufficient to grow us to maturity, to, uh, to give us the in information we need to honor and obey God and to do what, honor, what pleases him, to know him to the extent that we can on this side of, of glory. The scriptures are sufficient. We don't need to go to dreams and to visions and what does my pastor believe and what is my seminary professor believe or what impressions popped in my head when I read the scriptures. No, the scriptures are the authority, not these other things. But there was another word that I mentioned that's important, and that's the word clarity. Clarity means that when God says it, it's clear. He says it distinctly enough that you should be able to understand it. He's not trying to trick you. He's not trying to deceive you. He's trying to communicate truth in a way you can understand, you can comprehend, and you can respond to. But clarity does not guarantee understanding. Just because God has spoken clearly doesn't mean that you understand it. Let's say that you're playing baseball. You could throw, you could throw a strike right down the middle and the catcher can still drop the ball, okay? So the fact that God gives you the truth with clarity doesn't mean you're going to understand it. And so you say, well, well, how do we get to the point where clarity becomes understanding? That's actually really the point of this entire, uh, this entire passage of Scripture. The point is, it's the heart disposition. It is the disposition of the heart when the scriptures are brought to it that are going to ultimately determine understanding or a lack of understanding. Someone beginning to recognize the truth and act upon the truth and someone being continually blinded to it. And you say, well, what kind of a heart is necessary for us to understand the truth? Let me give you some, some important, simple thoughts. One, it's a heart that is attentive because it's willing to notice details. If you want to understand the scriptures, you have to be attentive to what God is saying, where you notice the details. Some people say, well, I'm not naturally inclined to be attentive. I, if you believe something is true, and you believe it's a matter of life and death, eternity, and it's a matter of understanding God's ways or not understanding God's ways, if you recognize this as his word, not just some man's opinion, then you begin to recognize the need to be attentive to it. The second word is the word humility. 
Am I willing to submit to what God says? One of the reasons we don't understand scripture is because we don't want to understand it. We don't want to hear what God has to say. We have a bias, a predisposed bias against the scriptures. And so an attentive heart is a heart that recognizes what I'm reading. A humble heart recognizes that I need to submit to what God says. The third word is the word fervency. Am I willing to dig? Am I willing to ask questions? Am I willing to do the work necessary so that understanding can, can come? The disciples had to say, Jesus, we don't get it. Why did they do that? Because they wanted to understand. They recognized what he was saying was true, even though they didn't understand it. They recognized that it was meant for them, and so they asked the question. And so I asked this question, are we willing to go and humble ourselves and say, can you give me clarification here? Sometimes what we need to do is go to an older believer and say, hey, I'm reading this passage of scripture. I'm kind of confused. I don't understand it. Can you give me some insight? And they may sit down with you and say, you know, that's a, diff that's a very difficult passage of scripture. That's a hotly debated passage of scripture. It may be that they can say, you know what? That, that passage is a little bit tough to understand, but let's work through it. Let's talk about the details and how it applies. That's what you have to do sometimes. So here's the simple question this morning. Do you have these qualities? Do you have a heart that wants to know the truth? If you have a heart that wants to know the truth, you'll be attentive to the details. You'll be willing to do what it says. You'll be fervent in digging, and you'll ask questions when you need to. My challenge to each of us this morning is that is how we will come to the scriptures. The details of this passage are very, very important, and I hope that it helps you for tomorrow as we continue in our study. Have a great rest of your day, and Lord willing, we will meet again tomorrow. Bye now.